I want to try to pick up on some of the points that uh, John Bennington made yesterday. And I'm going to focus my talk particularly on water, which uh, is a subject, I think, over which there's general consensus that there is a problem already, uh, not only in the hotter and drier parts of the world, but, but uh, even in many parts of uh, northern Europe. Um, and my first slide, in a sense, puts, puts this into context. I mean, we've looked in two or three of the talks at uh, historical development of grain yield. And of course, we've made the, several people have made the point that this appears to be stalling for some crops. Of course, there are exceptions. If you look in particular parts of the world, and here are some data for China, uh, there are, this is a pretty spectacular performance. And of course, we all understand the basis of this within the lifetime of, of many of us. Many Chinese people have uh, experienced very severe malnutrition. Many people have died as a result of lack of food. And this has provided some uh, impetus to a massive effort within China to try to increase food production. And the, this, I stress, uh, is a considerable success story. This is an example of intensification. The uh, grain area has declined over these 50 years. But under, by no stretch of the imagination can this be described as sustainable intensification because aside from the genetic input into this, this has been achieved by massive use of uh, resources. And this has considerable implications for the environment. And of course, there's a considerable question over just how long this uh, kind of thing can, can go on. Of course, there is. Uh, obvious recognition of this as a problem within China. And I want to give you an example of one uh, case study in which we have been uh, involved. This is a work in an oasis, uh, quite a large area, 100 kilometers or so long in, in northwest China, one of the driest parts of the country. It's an inland river system. The water runs down this uh, Shang River Valley. Uh, from the mountains, from snow melt. And you can see that the oasis is surrounded by desert. The expectation is that possibly within 20 years, if something quite serious isn't done, the oasis will disappear. And there are several hundred thousand people living there. Now, yesterday and today, we've had some really outstanding examples of how we can link food availability to people's health and well-being. And I think this is one. And it also shows, I hope, that actually plant science can, can be intimately involved in this and, and potentially can make uh, quite a positive, positive impact. Not so many years ago, this area was uh, a lake. But there is, if you look at the historical uh, Stream flow data over 50 years, uh, you can see a very substantial decline. And this is thought to be a result both of climate change impact, but also the fact that the farms in the upper reaches of this system are using too, too much water. The impact of that is the farms in the lower reach are using groundwater. There was discussion of that yesterday, so that over in this case, a 30-year period, you can see how the water table has gone from just a few meters from the surface now to tens of meters. Most of the water is tens of meters down, and in some cases, more than 100 meters below the surface. And the impact of that is this. Now, there's rampant desertification. The wells are dry. Uh, so there's, there's some very real local effects, but there are much bigger effects also. There, there are dust storms now which extend well beyond the area of this oasis, and this is becoming a major problem and clearly um, pretty unpleasant if you're involved in this, this kind of uh, thing. And the obvious impact on health and well-being is seen by abandoning of communities that previously have been very active, uh, agriculturally based communities, people are being forced to move. And what's proposed here is uh, something called water saving agriculture to try to produce 
more crop for drop. And towards the end of the talk, if I can break the habit of a lifetime and actually finish on time, I'll return to this and show you how successful this has been over a relatively short period of time. We can begin to see positive effects on environmental quality. But I want to say before that, obviously, I want to talk a little bit more about the science behind the sort of things that we might think of as components of water-saving agriculture or components of something which can, could contribute to uh, uh, something which approaches sustainable intensification. And it goes without saying, again, we've had some discussion of this, that there is a big opportunity around the world uh, to try to produce more crop per drop. Indeed, it's necessary that we do so. The difficulty is, as we all understand, plants uh, trade water for carbon, and if there isn't enough water, then there is less carbon, generally, less carbon capture, and that can be substantial, and that leads to this orange uh, part of the histogram, which is the so-called yield gap. And so a lot of the science that we've heard about in the last day um, we'll hear about and a lot of uh, science that's going on around the world is, is focused on trying to reduce, reduce the yield gap. The other, one, one other alternative, of course, is to try to make the potential yield. In this case, obviously, everything's described as 100, but can we, could we increase the potential yield, i.e. yield under relatively favorable conditions? And the argument from many is that if you can impact here, those effects will wash down into less favorable environments. And I'll, I'll talk about these two strategies and some of the things that uh, we might look at. And really what I'm going to say is that I believe that much of the science which addresses those two aims and others, and indeed might also be, as well as being applied through plant improvement programs, might also be applied via crop management programs, much of that science is actually uh, common to all of those things. I mean, we just simply need to know more about the drought stress responses of plants. And this is not a straightforward thing. I mean, drought is not straightforward. And I just simply put this slide up to show that we're not necessarily doing very well at this. The slope of the line is down, but actually to illustrate the point that there is massive fluctuation in the climate, the clim fluctuation in the climate is getting bigger and plants generally are not very well equipped to cope with this. And so we're looking potentially for quite a wide range of things. So I'm using, I'm going to use this cartoon really to describe using the John Passura identity that's been around for a few years now, the kind of, the sorts of traits that might contribute to drought resistance in, in the sense that we're sustaining yield with less water. And effectively, we're looking for more carbon capture, which was obviously the subject of several talks yesterday afternoon. And there's lots of interest in, uh, in and around introducing different kinds of uh, biochemistry and biophysics into leaves. But the other really important component of this is what happens to the carbon in the plant, how it's how it's partitioned, both pre-grain fill and obviously during, during grain fill. And, and there are thought to be quite good opportunities here for increasing harvest index. So I should just say the Passier identity trades yield for water. That's a fundamental determinant. There is a water use efficiency component, which relates to just how effective and a given amount of water is in producing a, a unit of yield. And then obviously, once uh, you've got biomass, once you've got uh, carbon captured, you can partition it. And the hope is that by playing around with this term, even under circumstances where we don't have more carbon capture, we could still get uh, a, yield, a yield benefit. This is just an example of that. I think this is a really nice piece of work by Yang and Zhang working in China. They've used a deficit irrigation technique, and I'll return to this later. 
This is work with rice, but they've also done similar work with uh, wheat. There, there are effectively four combinations of treatments. Half of the plants are well watered, half of them are subjected to water deficit. But if you look at the grain yield, the water deficit is so mild that it actually doesn't affect the yield, but comparing those two numbers. Those treatments are superimposed on a high and low nitrogen treatment. And the high nitrogen is a problem, particularly for the Chinese. We, there was some discussion of the fact that uh, yields have stalled here. In China, yields have actually declined as nitrogen applications have continued to go up. And we have some understanding of why this is. In this case, high nitrogen may well uh, result in a delayed senescence, which traps a lot of assimilate in the stem. And as a result of that, you get reduced grain yield, even though the plants are well watered. So nitrogen reduces the yield. The, the very mild water deficit, combined with the high nitrogen, you can see promotes senescence and allows you to take profit from that extra nitrogen. So you get this very substantial increase in grain yield. The carbon capture is exactly the same, uh, simply by playing around with, with the partitioning. And it's easy to do through simple crop management. And, and obviously, there are genetic options there as well. And that's the um, subject just, just of the next few slides. We're part of the so-called DROPS, Drought Resistant Plants Consortium, which is funded by the EU, is led by Francois Tardieu from Montpellier. It's uh, a public-private research partnership. Um, and our targets are precisely the targets that you saw in the cartoon uh, a couple of slides ago. So we're interested in capturing carbon. I didn't mention roots. I should have said that obviously you need some roots. I mean, there's an interesting question about just how much root you need, but we're going to look at that this afternoon. You need to translate that with some sort of efficiency. So there's a water use efficiency term. And then there's, there's the partitioning term. And, and it's not just a case of filling the grains. It's a case of preventing them from aborting. And both in, mo in all the cereals, seed abortion is a real problem under stress in wheat, obviously, particularly as the temperature increases. But water <coughs> deficit is a big, a big issue in maize, as you can uh, see. So our, our approach within DROPS is that we, rather than look for a magic bullet, um, we feel that there may be uh, profit in an approach which, which combines genomics, physiology, genetics, phenotyping, but also quite a lot of modeling to try to deal with the genetics times environment interaction, particularly the fact that some traits may be brilliant under particular sets of climatic conditions and, frankly, disastrous under others. And clearly, that all of those combinations, it will be hard to test those, even in a big plant improvement program. And the feeling is a lot of that can be done uh, through, through modeling. And uh, Graham Hammer and Scott Chapman and others in Australia are doing that part of the, the project. We're in Lancaster, we're interested in phenotyping for differences in water use efficiency. This is our platform. There are 100 logging balances that we can water them automatically. We measure the growth. Um, we measure all sorts of other variables. And the idea is to try to identify some genetic variation and to understand the basis of that. And our target traits are obviously water use efficiency, but we are also inter interested in trying to understand the basis of it. We, we heard this morning about stomata and some of the things that may control stomata, and we, we're interested in, in hormones. And I'm going to say a bit about that. So these are some very recent data collaborating with um, uh, Roberto Tuberosa from Bologna. One of his colleagues, Rosella Franca, work, worked with us for the last few months on Durham wheat. And we've got some very interesting 
genetic variation in water use efficiency, and we're focusing on 10 accessions, five of which have consistently higher water use efficiency and five of which have lower water use efficiency. When I say focusing, some of our work is to try to understand the basis of that. And you can see some variation in, in ABA and ethylene there. And I want to talk about that. I want to just say a little bit about how that may be uh, important. And we have some new data which we think show, throws some light on that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to analyze those data anymore, but just talk more generally about how hormones might work within the plant to detect, to allow, help the plant with detection of climatic stress, edaphic stress, how these responses within the plant might be integrated. And this, this effectively uh, summar summarizes that. And the question, obviously, in the context of this talk is, you know, to what extent is it possible to exploit this biology to, to try to produce more crop per, per drop of water? There's obviously a debate going on in, in the literature around just where these signals are produced and uh, what's, how, how the signals are made up and read and sent. Um, I, and I don't really want to get into that today, just simply to try to convince you that this does seem to be an important mechanism and that it may be something that is, is accessible to manipulation. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, abscisic acid, but, and rather than review some of that, I just want to say a little bit about eth ethylene, because ethylene is, is a problem for plants which experience all kinds of both abiotic and biotic stresses, and I've listed some of them there at, at the top. And then I've, I've just produced a brief list of where ethylene may impact adversely. I mean, we know there are very adverse effects on root extension, for example. There, are, there is limitation of leaf growth. Uh, I'm going to show you some uh, effects on disruption of gas exchange. And there's some very nice work in China and elsewhere looking at the effects of ABA ethylene ratios on grain, <coughs> grain filling and, uh, and also on grain, grain abortion. As a sort of proof of concept of the importance of this, I thought I'd just show you these data which are, have been provided to me by Syngenta, Dow, and Agrifresh. They are uh, looking to develop this compound in Vinsa, which is a compound which stops ethylene binding. And the, these are applications that have been made to wheat in trials in various parts of the world, plants under uh, various kinds of environmental stress, and they are delta yields. When you apply different amounts of the compound at different stages, I, don't, I won't go into detail, the impact can be very positive. And on, uh, across the piece, it, for me, that, that's an effect that is worth having. So there seems to be something to go at there. Sally Wilkinson and I have um, suggested in the literature that the interaction between ABA and ethylene may be important in the regulation of many processes, and we're particularly interested in stomatal behavior and in leaf growth, but you see the same kind of response in terms of the regulation of root growth and, and also reproductive development, as I've said. And this cartoon shows that uh, under many circumstances, and people who work with hormones obviously know this, the same hormone can have wildly different, differing effects. So increasing ethylene accumulation may close stomata under some circumstances or open them under others, and particularly depending on how much ABA there is in the plant. So I'll give you, I'll show you an example of that. These are some uh, effects of water deficit. Uh, the deficit is getting more severe as we go on. The well water plants are the first column in each group, and we set those at 100. So if we look on day three, after a few days of soil drying, 
This is, these are open stomata in well-watered plants. As a result of withholding water, the stomata close. If you spray those plants with low concentrations of ACC, stomata reopen. So if you like, ethylene is opening the stomata. Sorry, I, I apologize. This is, if you spray the droughted plants, you, you open the stomata quite substantially. If you spray well-watered plants, the same concentration of ABA closes the stomata. So the same hormone at the same <coughs> concentration can have opposite effects, we would argue, depending upon the amount of ABA that's in the plant. So our analysis needs to take account of these kinds of uh, interactions, obviously not just between these two hormones, but between others. And here's, here's an example to show you that this does occur in reality. If you ozonate plants, this is a concentration of ozone that you find outside here in, on most reasonably bright spring or summer days. Uh, abscisic acid opens stomata. In clean air, filtered air, abscisic acid closes stomata entirely predictably, but that is a serious problem under drought. We get a lot of ozone under circumstances where it is hot and dry. Plants under those circumstances can lose control of their stomata, seemingly because ethylene, which is produced under ozone, prevents the stomata from responding to abscisic acid. And we believe that ozone will have similar effects on other aspects of plant, plant development. Now this is actually, you can, you can demonstrate that, that the ozone effect is through ethylene, through using Invinsa, but I think given the fact that the time is racing, um, I, if anybody's interested in that, I'd be delighted to talk about it. But that interaction under ozone is important, similar interaction under heat stress and water stress. And of course, there are many parts of the world where those things occur together. And we're looking at the Indo-Gangetic Plain in some work with CIMIT in the so-called Wheat Yield Consortium. This is a region where these, these stresses are commonly occurring together, and modeling suggests to us that if nothing is done, that by 2050, wheat yield will decline by 40 to 50 percent, and sim similar, slightly smaller effects on maize production. And we can see many of these larger environmental effects already happening because farmers are using too much water in the region. So there's a, there's a real parallel here with the Chinese situation. And the idea is to try to look within CIMIT's breeding program for plants which show more favorable responses to this combination of stresses, do, do some phenotyping under these combinations of stresses and see whether we can have some impact on um, the material that's available. I'm going to skip over that one. Is it about five minutes, is that? Or two? Yeah. Le less than that. OK. So I want to just come back to, I, I hope I've shown you there's something to go out genetically, potentially through physiologically trait-based breeding, obviously with, um, with the benefit of genetic with genomics as well. I want to now just come briefly and finish up and talk a little bit more about some of the crop management um, that might be applied to exploit the same kind of biology. So this is a cartoon which focuses on the below ground system and clearly plant improvement is an important option here. There are all sorts of things that we can target and that will hopefully have positive effects on yield. But there are also lots of other opportunities for manipulating the environment using different cropping systems, putting nutrients and water on in particular ways, in particular places, and then other opportunities for manipulating soil biology. And I, I just want to show you a couple of examples of these two things which are targeted at the same kind of biology that we've just been talking about. And 
Here's a meta-analysis which my colleague Ian Dodd has put together, comparing two kinds of deficit irrigation. This is a pl giving the plant less water than is actually required to fully rehydrate it. This is a situation that most farmers find themselves in now. The, the, the kind of treatment that we're interested in is just watering part of the root system because we've done quite a lot of work to show that this par partial root zone drying can stimulate the sort of signaling that's of interest to us and we can, the plant can benefit from that. And we've expressed this as a yield ratio. If we were applying the same amount of water, both treatments use the same amount of water, in one case we're putting it on the whole root system and in the other case, we're putting it just on part of the root system. And you can see that almost invariably, the plants that have water on any part of their root system produce more yield, and significantly more so. This is the same amount of water just put on a different way. And I think this is quite a good example of the fact that this, some, some kind of signaling is going on here. You know, whatever it is, it looks as if there are ways in which we can exploit it. Farmers will use less water, but may get other benefits as well. There are bacteria which will break down ethylene. They have high levels of ACC deaminase. They want the carbon and the nitrogen. And we find very positive effects, particularly in drying soil, on nodulation, but also positive effects on seed yield. And it, there are, we can find reduced levels of ACC in the xylem, and again, so it looks again as if there are management, low cost, immediately applicable ways of trying to exploit this biology. And this is the kind of thing that we're doing with the people from China Agricultural University as part of this sort of water saving agriculture passage, which was where I started. And this is the payoff. This is, these are some data collected at the catchment level to look at the impact of applying these te thousands of farmers literally applying these techniques. And this one is the annual decline in groundwater. So the groundwater is not coming back up yet, but it's going down less rapidly as a result of working with farmers to try to get them to use less water. And there are lots of ways, low technology ways that you can do this, but water saving irrigation techniques are are important in this regard. So I, I think that's really important data. Just two slides to finish with. This is a project that we're very fortunate to be involved with with Adam Price, who's here, there's a poster, where some of these irrigation techniques are being used in Bangladesh, obviously with rice, obviously to save water. But one of the other deliverables <coughs> here is to try to impact positively on nutritional quality of grain. And the problem is that rice in this region takes up very large amounts of arsenic. People eat a lot of rice, and they therefore eat a lot of arsenic with very negative effects on health. The Recent literature suggests that some of these deficit irrigation techniques, in this case another version of partial root zone drying, which is intermittent wetting and drying, which impacts on hormone biology, profoundly reduces arsenic in the poor water of rice paddies. And the project sponsored by BBSRC is to look to see whether that impacts positively on nutritional quality of rice. So I, this is a really exciting, important project. 100,000 Bangladeshi farmers will be using alternative wetting and drying irrigation in the coming season. So it's, well, there's an opportunity to test it on a broad scale. The conclusion, in, in my view, there are lots of possibilities. There's sustainable intensification, which as defined in reaping the benefits by the Royal Society, made the point, excuse me, that no techniques or technologies should, should be ruled out. And I, I hope you get a feel that somehow I think it, we can make a difference if we can take profit both from genetics and from crop management. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues in Lancaster. I tried to mention them as we go through, but also a, a range of um, 
really but collaborators who are extremely valuable to us and obviously people that provided the money. Thank you very much. So it's Phil Molyneux, University of Essex. Bill, um, it was very nice, but do you think the current phenotyping platforms would have the resolution to be able to essentially do a, a breeding program for water productivity traits? Yeah, I think I, that's a really key question to me. I mean, we, we're very interested if we can find something that, that um, could be used to indicate ethylene production or, some, or ethylene ABA ratio or something like that. But it is very hard. In CIMIT and in many other places, they use um, infrared thermography. I mean, we saw this morning how that can indicate how much water plants are, are losing. They're looking for cool canopies. These are plants which have open stomata with, and they argue that the roots are deeper. One of the reasons CIMIT's interested in our ozone work is it's just possible they're selecting for genotypes that have stomata that are particularly sensitive to ozone and are opening in response to that. So, you know, you've got to be careful with some, some of these rather indirect measures, which obviously people adopt for, for thoroughly good reasons, because they are, they are uh, easier to do. But I think it's absolutely the key issue. If we're interested in physiological traits, we've got to be able to provide the breeders with convenient ways of, yeah, exactly.